Tonight on Life on the Rock, we'll speak with Sister Helena Burns, host of EWTN's Digital Catholic. We'll hear some insights from Father Bryce Sibley on love and darkness, and we'll join Father Joseph in the garden and much more. Well, welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight, our guest is Sister Helena Burns. She's a daughter of St. Paul and host of EWTN's Digital Catholics. And then we're gonna go into the garden with Father Joseph once again. He has a very important message for us about okra and the health benefits of it and how it relates to eternal life. I'm amazing you can say that with a straight face, Father. <laughs> but we're also going to show you some clips that we went up to Chicago at a Focus Leadership Conference and we recorded a bunch of interviews. And tonight we're going to show you a little segment with Father Bryce Sibley. This is Father Bryce Sibley, um, priest of the Diocese of Lafayette here at SEEK 2018. You know, uh, as a campus minister, I work a lot with uh, college students who have questions about God's existence. Why is there so much suffering and darkness in the world? also in their own lives, feeling God's absence, that he's distant, trying to understand where God is, why is he permitting these things? And the truth is, is I, I realize I don't have any answers for this. I don't know why the Lord permits darkness, so much suffering, at least intellectually. But from looking at my work with people and also understanding the lives of the saints, particularly St. Therese and Mother Teresa, the only answer is love. Somehow the Lord permits this darkness, we may never understand it, but by choosing to love, no matter how dark you feel or how much you feel that God's not in existence, you can still love. Mother Teresa did it through the darkness that she saw around her and the poverty and suffering and also the darkness she experienced. You can still choose. We can still choose to love other people and that love is a light to the world. And ultimately, once everything passes away, What's that one thing we're gonna be judged on? Not that we had some theological understanding of the problem of evil, but that we were able to love even in the darkness. Well, welcome Sister Helena to Life on the Rock. Thank you, good to be back. And you've done some work for EW10, the Digital Catholic. Tell us a little bit about that show you did for us. Right, so back in November 2016, um, you all, for me, mm -hmm. shot my Digital Catholics seminars that I do. Mm -hmm. It's just, and so now it's an EWTN DVD called mm -hmm. Digital Catholics. Okay. And basically, it's just a great discussion starter. So it's five 30-minute segments mm -hmm introducing people to the church's official teaching on media, which is media literacy. How do we engage in the world of media well, understanding it and using it well? And so it's broken down into five segments, starting off with just the basics of church teaching on media, uh, parenting and teaching media, how do we help our young people? Then we talk about using media humanly, especially social media and our devices, and the time for our devices is not 24-7. Right. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And then the fifth segment, we examine the future of media. So where is all this digital media going? Right. Which of course is up to us by the choices we make today right. of how we use media, thus yeah. will go media. And it, I think it goes well with another love you have of the theology of the body. You teach online classes on that. And especially like in the social media world, these issues that theology of the body addresses come up so often and it's a way of presenting the gospel, I think, that's very attuned to what our, our culture is really struggling with. Yes. Tell us, uh, first give us a definition of theology of the body. There's so many ways we could define theology of the body. Of course, it's from John Paul II. He coined that phrase. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a theology of the body among others. Mm -hmm. It's his. He owns it. Mm -hmm. right, <laughs> JP right. too owns And nobody did anything as comprehensive as he did. Right. So it's actually a Bible study. The, the big thick text goes from Genesis to Revelation, mm -hmm. hitting almost every book of the Bible, mm -hmm. looking at what is the human body saying? Mm -hmm. What is God saying about the human body? So mm -hmm. we, we could have a theology of food. What is food saying about God? What is God mm -hmm. saying about food? We could have a theology of sports. Mm -hmm. What is sports saying about God? What is God mm -hmm. saying about sports? But if it's the human body, then God is saying a lot about it 
And it's saying a lot about God because only the human person, which includes the mm -hmm. human body, mm -hmm. in creation is said to be in the image of God. Mm -hmm. So the human person reveals something about God and, uh, and certainly God has revealed about us, you know, and all his revelation of who he is and his plan for our salvation, right? So there's right. this beautiful. Right. And I call theology of the body the gospel of the body mm -hmm. because people no longer believe in spiritual uh, authorities or texts or organized religion right. or things they can't see, yeah. which is positivism. Right. I only believe in what I can see. So John Paul II said, fine, we can start there. So the culture hasn't given up on beauty, love, the body, relationships, mm -hmm. and God is all about those things. Right. So JP2, he was using phenomenology, the philosophy of phenomenology, mm -hmm. which starts with, with the phenomenon, mm -hmm. with what you can see. He said, fine, let's unpack that. Yeah. And he also gave, in a sense, a new starting point for all of theology and all of philosophy, right. a return to the body, right. a return to the physical, instead of just tripping out on the spiritual and abstract thinking and making things up right. <laughs> that may not even be in, in accord with reality, right. and then right. imposing on, on the physical world and our bodies what we want, what we think, what we feel. Because we forget, like, being made in the image and likeness of God includes the body. I mean, we think of it, yes. the spiritual part, we have an intellect and will, God has a divine intellect, divine will, uh, but also our body itself images God and reveals our call to communion, you know, the right. male and the female right. have complementary differences yep. that allows them to unite, to procreate, to act as one there, two becoming one flesh. So reveals God as a Trinitarian of persons, a communion of persons. And I didn't there. understand that until yeah. Theology of the Body. I thought it was basically my soul that was made in the image of God because right. God is spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of that dualism where we think our, our soul is better and higher and more pure and beautiful and spiritual yeah. than our body, which is lowly and dirty and tainted and earthly right. and animalistic. Right. And it's like, no, both are human, both are good, both are me. Both are sacred. I don't yeah. have a body. I am a body. And that is one of your favorite themes, too, about yes. the sacredness of yeah. the body. You said in your classes, and I was struck by this, you said uh, some of your male students get that pretty quickly. Tell us about that. So <laughs> that might sound counterintuitive, but the body, part of the language of the body is saying Men's sexuality is external to their bodies. Mm -hmm. That means something because mm -hmm. the body means something. It's g partly God's transcendence. Mm -hmm. Men are imaging God's transcendence. Women's sexuality is internal to their bodies. That's saying something because the body matters. The mm -hmm. body has, is teaching us something. That's God's imminence, how God loves yeah. us imminently. Right. So men learn through externality. Yeah. And the concrete physical world really speaks to them. Um, Guys are all about the bottom line. They go mm -hmm. right to the bottom mm -hmm. line. Like, what is this for? What is this about? What, what is mm -hmm. it? And John Paul II talks about this in his Love and Responsibility, that men understand the difference between the sexes better than women even do. Mm -hmm. So I talk to all ages. When I talk to teens and I talk about, I say, so our bodies are sacred. Mm -hmm. so is the media telling you that? And yeah. they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we talk about sex and yeah. the, the real yeah. purpose and meaning of sex. And the guys start to like nod their heads. They're like, yeah, okay, you know, I could get that. And the girls, <laughs> I'm kind of joking, mm -hmm. but like, they're like, our bodies are sacred? What? <laughs> you know, it's like, and the guys are like, oh, yeah, yeah. I get that. Like, I get it. Because yeah. men are very good at, sub, uh, sorry, objective truth. Yeah. And women are very good at subjective truth, mm -hmm. which is very important, mm -hmm. too. It's the personalization. Mm -hmm. Because if we just trip out an objective truth, we wind up in utilitarianism. Mm -hmm. How can I use this thing? Yeah. How can I get the most out of this, most money, the mm -hmm. most whatever? And we, we can't live in a world like that. Right. But we need men's gifts of objective truth and yeah. the ability to understand objectivity. Women personalize and humanize everything. So yeah. women are always going to insert the human element. How is this going to affect families? Mm -hmm. How is this going to affect children? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't do that to a human being, right, <laughs> you right. know? So women will always, um, with that subjective truth, and John Paul II says we have to keep both the objectivity and subjectivity of the human person in balance at all moments. Right. 
Well, we'll continue with these themes and talk about the sexual revolution and the theology party, what has to say about that as well, uh, just after this break. Sister, I love this story about the men in your class uh, getting excited about the sacredness of the body and, and their call to, to order the garden, to cultivate till the garden, to bring a sense of divine order to things. And you've said that kind of thrills a man's heart. It, to me, it's like an echo of Genesis where he yeah. sings when he sees Eve, right? He yeah. marvels, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, yeah. that he appreciates the great gift of femininity right. in, in the woman. And men have insight into how things work. So the fact that Adam in one of the creation stories was created first, he was alone for a long time, mm. it was him and God and the animals, mm. and he learned how things worked and how the world worked, and he knew the animals so well he could name them. Mm. And then Eve comes along, and he realizes she's completely different from right. any of these mm. animals, and he bursts forth in a poem. Mm. <laughs> it's yeah. the, the first utterance, human utterance in the Bible is a poem about how beautiful a woman is, right? Mm. But for the woman, her first purview has always been included the human. Yeah. So she always includes the human in all of her deliberations, yeah. and she can help to, while, while the man is civilizing the world, yeah. she can help to civilize persons. Yeah. That's yeah. her specialty and her gift, is to teach children, teach men how mm -hmm. to love, how to uh, put the human first. And you even know? like the mother kind of introduces the father to the children, right. brings them into that realm. Right, right. So she has that imminent love. Yeah. She reflects God's imminent mm -hmm. love. God right here, God with us, God here yeah. and now in the moment, drawing, the, even like the way a woman's arms are made, mm -hmm. are meant to draw the world mm -hmm to herself to make it a better place, whereas men's bodies are made to go out and work on the world mm -hmm. to make it a better place. Mm -hmm. And again, this isn't saying like women can never work outside the home. We're not saying right. that or whatever, right. or men can never be a stay-at-home dad. Yeah. It's just how our bodies are and how our souls are. So when we talk about masculinity and femininity, we don't want to stereotype. We don't want to make create caricatures mm -hmm. or glass ceilings or mm -hmm. boxes to put people in or labels. It's just what flows naturally from yeah. the body and soul of a yeah. woman or a man and what they're good at. So right. the design of something shows what it's made for yeah. and what it does and what it does best. And if we stay in that line, we, we find an, a fulfillment. A yes. We find a joy and a, a fulfillment of flourishing. And as you said, gifts. We were talking yeah. about this earlier yeah. and you were talking about, it's not just roles, mm -hmm. you know, gender roles. Yeah. It's the gifts of yeah. women and the right. gifts of men, right. which John Paul II and Benedict and Francis yeah. have yeah. all spoken about. And if women, for example, don't honor our own gifts because we think they're smaller gifts than a lot of male gifts, which tend to be the big, external, flashy, mm -hmm. you know, create cities and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, our gifts create international peace. <laughs> you know, if everybody had empathy, <laughs> personalization, subjectivization. Um, Recognition and dignity of life. Dignity of yeah. life, yeah. interpersonal communication, mm -hmm. um, listening to everyone's yeah. opinion, you know, right. those kinds of things make for that. So it's not one is superior, yeah. Yeah. we're just different. Right. But we're meant to put our gifts together and work yeah. together for the full picture. And John Paul said that so often, yeah, to bring both at service of culture, society, yes, and that it's so needed. And, and there's always this pushback. So sometimes the male is starting to dominate. So the female mm -hmm. should push back. Sometimes the female, we have our own mm -hmm. ways of dominating and mm -hmm. men should need to push yeah. back yeah. so that we can achieve that beautiful balance. But we also need men to lead, yeah. you know, and um, because when men lead, women and children can flourish. Right. When good men lead, women and children can flourish. When good men don't lead or aren't allowed to lead, right. women and children have to scramble and do everything for themselves. Yeah. And we know the sociological data is not good. The plan is to have men and women raising children together, mm -hmm. if at all possible, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but we have to let each other give our gifts. So men have to not dominate women, but let us do our thing, right? Yeah. And women have to appreciate men's gifts and let men do their thing, even though it's not the same. Yeah. Our gifts are not identical. And I, I see that in marriages so often. Like they have a number of children and the men just have a sense of like the domain and where you let the women feather the nest, build the home, the heart of the family. And there's a wonderful flourishing there. Yeah. Let's quickly talk about the sexual revolution. You talk about 
we speak of sexual, sexual revolution as you know, in the 60s, the separation of sex and procreation, disintegration of marriage, hookup culture, all that. You say that's bad for the human person. What ways is it bad? So just a quick um, talking about men and women, I heard a priest say recently that mm -hmm. the sexual battle, the uh, battle of the sexes, mm -hmm. women lost. Yeah. In the sexual revolution, we lost because the point was free sex, mm -hmm. right? And that's what men were always trying to get women to, to right, do. Right. And once we did that, we lost value in the sight of men, in men's eyes, mm -hmm. and everything that came with it, abortion mm -hmm. and everything else. So women, because men learn externally, women are t always teaching men and telling men what our value is. And the value yeah. we place on ourselves is what men learn is our value. Yeah. Yeah. So they, I've actually made a chart. So when I teach Theology of the Body, we have uh, what God, creation, the Bible, church, and science are saying, and they're all on the same mm -hmm. page, about what is actually good for the human person. Um, physically, our physical health, our spiritual health, our psychological health, mental health, and our relationships. And it would make sense that all of that saying the same thing, because mm -hmm. God made creation, he gave us the church and the Bible, and all science does is show us how amazing everything is yeah. that God made, and how it yeah. works, and how it works best. Right. So I have these columns, and they all yeah. match up. And then I have this sexual revolution over here, out in left field, yeah. totally unscientific, saying, telling us to do what's bad for ourselves. Right. And we have decades of data now. Yeah that has proven and right. showed us that everything God ever taught us was good for us yeah. actually is. Right. Everything God ever taught us is bad for us actually is. But we insist on kind of being seduced by these easy ways of doing things that require nothing of us. Yeah, we have to wrap up sadly here, but it, it too, it's like a male, it's a fallen male model of sexuality. Yes. We should say that, that we, the world's embraced. And you make a beautiful point that if we want true equality between the sexes, you know, promote marriage, promote chastity, yes. promote NFP, that this will serve the dignity of both spouses, especially the women. Yes, the and, and men were never intended to have sex that way, just yeah, promiscuously, yeah, right. right? So we have to teach our young men, no, who's teaching them, how to yeah. initiate the gift of love and life properly. That's right. their job, that's what they do. Yeah. Women receive the gift of love and life and then return it. But it's men's job to initiate that. Yeah. And if we can teach our young men how to do that properly, you know, it, the whole thing of dating, we don't know how to date anymore. Mm -hmm. Nobody's mm -hmm. dating. Yeah. So we, we've got to, and we don't want to go back to some past yeah. glorious yeah. era that yeah. never actually existed. Yeah. This is moving forward. Right. Theology of the body is the way forward, taking into account that we passed through the sexual revolution and all its morphing, yeah. you know, yeah. and now we want to um, reclaim what's actually good for us. Thank you so much, sister, for being on Life on the Rock. Thank you. We're now going to Fruit of the Earth with Father Joseph. Welcome to Plant Gardens and Eat the Fruits, a series dedicated to enjoying the goodness of God's creation and helping you to be healthy in body and soul. I'm standing in front of my okra plants here and you notice that I planted a raised bed. So this is a nice bed that I don't have to stoop over to pull weeds or maintain it. Or, and if you can have the time to do it, it's well worth it because it pays off in the end. And so I planted these okra seeds earlier and they just keep growing higher and higher and higher. And although in the northern climates you may not be familiar with okra, it's very popular here in the south in Alabama where I am. In Louisiana, they use it in gumbos. I like to take off the uh, seed pods, which you see here at the top, and then you cut them up, put some flour, some cornmeal on them, and just to roast them with some salt and pepper as well. They're very high in uh, fiber, of course, as well as in the nutritional values of vitamin C, potassium, and calcium, and folate, a uh, type of B vitamin. This size here is a nice size to, uh, to use. It's more tender. If it gets too big, then it becomes tougher. And you see the beautiful blossoms that this plant produces. You know, you want a garden to be beautiful, something that enhances the beauty of your home and something that you enjoy going out to. But I like also to think about how okra just keeps climbing higher and higher. You can see on the lower levels, 
I've clipped off okra pods as it's kept growing. And then it keeps putting out new shoots going higher and continuing to produce those fruits up above. I'm gonna need a ladder pretty soon to get to the top of these things. But it reminds me of the passage of St. Paul's letter to the Colossians chapter three, where he says, be on, intent on things above where Christ is seated at the Father's right hand. Think of things above rather than on things of this earth. And you know, that's what enriches our whole lives, isn't it? To think of the things of heaven, the glory that God has prepared for us. And we can even see it in some of his creation, the beauty of his creation, that it already redounds or it, it points to that greater beauty that our eye hasn't yet seen. But it's an attribute of God as his beauty that we even see in some of the things, the beautiful things that he has made. So let us continue striving higher. We can begin our heaven now, growing in that life of grace each day, bearing fruits, you know, throughout our lives, and then one, enjoy in, one day enjoying that eternal embrace of heaven. And concluding once again with the words of St. Francis and his, his beautiful canticle of Brother Son, praise to you, O God, for the earth, our mother, who produces wonderful fruits. Well, we had a good show for you tonight. Uh, we like to tease Father Joseph about yeah. his garden segments, but he, he always makes a great point. Mm -hmm. And he's told me that okra is like, it's indestructible. It can grow mm -hmm. in the hot weather, rainy yeah. weather, whatever. And he had a great point about it growing higher and higher and that mm -hmm. we as Christians are called to set our minds, our hearts on things that are above, to think of the good mm -hmm. things. Think about God and mm -hmm. his plan and our relationship in, in life. And I think Father Bryce echoed that too, in a way, sure. in loving in the darkness, mm -hmm. that we all experience darkness in some way. Sometimes mm -hmm. there's the trials of the mystical life mm -hmm. of dark night of the soul, but mm -hmm. also there's darkness from our sin, from other mm -hmm. people's sins and that we're called to love in that darkness mm -hmm. without maybe experiencing powerful good feelings, maybe difficult, mm -hmm. discouraging situations, we're called to continued love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what we see from, from Jesus the Lord in his final hours. You know, there he is in complete darkness. Evil has fallen upon him. It's, it's just crushing him like a very heavy weight. And what is he doing? He's loving. Mm -hmm. He's loving till the end. And so we are all called to have that love, mm -hmm. and but that's how we grow in that love, by going through some darkness, uh, walking through some trials. Mm -hmm. yeah. And certainly culturally, as Sister Helena said, when we're talking about the sexual revolution, mm -hmm. we are in dark times. Yeah. Uh, the sexual revolution has not delivered on some promise of new freedom, new joy, happiness. You know, we talked about that, how mm -hmm. you know, separating love and sex and from marriage, from procreation, has had all these devastating consequences. Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is true love, that sexuality is made for marriage, mm -hmm. and that it's really a solution, too, to the struggle that women are having in the culture, too. Mm -hmm. If you want full equality, marriage gives us that, mm -hmm. chastity gives us that, right. even practicing NFP within mm -hmm. marriage. I thought that was a great mm -hmm. point, to live the fullness of the gospel answers this yearning for uh, a flourishing life that we all have. Oh, amen, Father Mark. Mm -hmm. And that is the way God designed us to live. And this is why he hands on the sacred truths to us, both found in scripture and tradition, so that we can live a happier and healthier and holier life, of course. Right. So to set our minds on the things above, as Father Joseph told us, Colossians 3, uh, we do need to take some time out from the media world. Oh, we do, yes. We work in it, we live yeah. in it and everything, but you also need to put the phone down at times. Mm -hmm. And that's our Into the Vineyard challenge this week, to make time for others, to love others, mm -hmm. to love in the situation. Mm -hmm. And at times, we just gotta put that phone down, yeah. right? Talk that's to the right. person across yeah, the table, you know, We, have to, we need that interaction, you yeah. know, a good interface. Human beings here, you know, when you're on the phone, you're just communicating on the phone. You don't see the true beauty, the true goodness yeah. of a person, you know, you yeah. miss out on it. So that, that's a danger in our culture today. And the gospel brings a new life, a new a love of other people that can bring a great human flourishing. Mm -hmm. So that's our Into the Vineyard challenge. And we'll send you into that vineyard with a blessing. May our Heavenly Father shine his face upon you. May he give you his peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week on Life on the Rock.
to love.